All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. Today we are continuing our exploration of the literature uh, that is sort of going around the social movements of the 1960s, whether it's emerging from it, related to it, about it, uh, in the aftermath of it. And that will really be a continued theme of the next couple of weeks of the course. Um, though a lot, you know, some of the literature we're reading is from the 60s, some of it is going to go all the way through the, the 80s and uh, even early 90s in terms of what we're reading in the next three weeks, but we're really looking into the consequences of those social movements uh, that we were discussing last week around uh, gender and race and sexuality as well as the anti-war movement. Um, and so we're going to continue that, and we're also looking at that in continuity with what we were talking about in the previous weeks about postmodernism and where does post where do postmodern ideas fit into this? So we've looked at um, poetry, we've looked at some fiction with regard to postmodernism, and we're going to look at some fiction with regard to the the uh, the movements in the next next week, especially with the the multicultural movement that really emerges from the late '60s uh, race and gender liberation movements. But what we want to look at right now, in the case of Joan Didion, is some of the changes that came about in nonfiction around postmodernism. Now, Joan Didion is probably the most well-known and beloved writer who chronicled the protest movements of the 1960s. And interestingly, she did it from a very uh, I would say skeptical uh, perspective. It's not a very good picture you get of these movements when you read her work. Um, and she went on to uh, to chronicle other affairs in international and American life from a skeptical perspective. And in fact, skeptical is really the main word I would apply to Joan Didion. And she did so as a part of a movement in nonfiction that comes about called the new journalism. So we want to look at that. Now, they strangely did not give you very much Joan Didion to read in the Norton Anthology. They put her in a section called creative nonfiction, which is a term we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and they just gave a very brief excerpt from one of her most famous essays. And I don't really understand that because she is uh, one of the most famous and sort of iconic celebrity kind of writers of her generation, so I don't really see why there isn't more of her to read in the Norton Anthology. Uh, so, But that's okay. We'll make do with what we have, and we can still get a lot out of it. Um, so who is Joan Didion? Let's just look at her background and her biography briefly, and then we'll talk about new journalism and about her writing style. So she was born in 1934 in Sacramento, California, and she attended UC Berkeley, which is the same place that uh, Philip K. Dick briefly went. You'll notice again, we have a couple trends here. All the writers we're reading now, sort of starting in that postmodern moment, were all born in the 30s. And that's going to be a, an interesting, uh, I think, little remarked and little understood understood trend is that the major American writers of the second half of the 20th century, especially in the 60s and after, were all born around the 30s uh, and were therefore sort of in that middle generation between the, the so-called, uh, I just mean so-called because that's what they're called, the greatest generation who fought in World War II and then the much more famous baby boomers and then there was this little generation in between uh, that they're so they're called the silent generation, the sort of Gen X of their time, the, the sort of middle middle child of uh, of the world there. Uh, and yet most of the great and famous American writers of the late 20th century come out of this period uh, of the 30s. That's when they were born because they were uh, sort of too young to be in the youth cultures of the 60s. So they sort of were or let me let me put it another way, too old to be part of the youth cultures of the 60s. 60s because by the time the late 60s roll around they're starting to enter something more like middle age and so they're able to sort of get uh, get a perspective on it uh, but anyway that's a digression so Joan Didion born in 1934 I'm just saying watch for it all the you know so many of the writers we've been reading and are going to read were born in the 30s uh, and that's going to be true right up until we we get to the, the 21st century um, 
And then all the writers we're going to read are going to be Generation X, born in the 60s and 70s. So th these middle generations seem to produce a lot of interesting writers. Anyway, I'm still digressing. Back to Joan Didion. So, uh, and the other thing you note, I don't know if I said this already, but the West Coast trend again. We have this movement, uh, uh, this sort of regional diversification of American literature happening where you had this previous dominance of the East Coast, particularly New York City, and then there'd be a couple of writers who would be Southern uh, or be Midwestern or something, but there would be this East Coast dominance. And then starting with the Beats and into the 60s, you have this uh, this kind of West Coast shift. So she won an essay contest at a young age and did spend seven years in New York City working at Vogue magazine and becoming a journalist. And then she married her fellow writer, John Gregory Dunn, and they moved back to California and in this case to Los Angeles. And Didion is one of the... Um, iconic Los Angeles writers, along with uh, Raymond Chandler, the detective novelist of the early generation. Uh, these are writers that sort of have cemented kind of a literary image of what Los Angeles is, this kind of uh, glamorous but desolate city plagued by these Santa Ana winds that blow through, blow down through the canyons or whatever. I'm, I'm doing kind of an imitation. But, uh, but these, you know, Los Angeles gets sort of put on the literary map by Didion, among others. And she is most famous for her journalism. She's most famous really as an essayist, a journalistic essayist. Uh, and she she was put on the literary map by her essays on the 60s counterculture. So she published a first novel that's not much discussed. And then in the late 60s, she published this collection of essays consisting of reported journalistic pieces she had done for magazines and newspapers called Slouching Towards Bethlehem. And I'll, I'll explain the title momentarily. And this really uh, made her kind of a literary star. And it was a series of responses largely to the counterculture, particularly the title essay, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, which they give you an excerpt of in the Norton Anthology is this series of responses to the 60s counterculture and the 60s protest movements. And then among those were some other personal essays and other journalistic essays. Uh, they, some of them centered around the, the social movements and protest movements as well. She was also a novelist. Uh, she's written, I think, four or five novels, that many of which are highly acclaimed, particularly her second one, Play It As It Lays, which is, a, again, a great Los Angeles novel and a rather harrowing novel on the topic of abortion. Uh, and uh, the, the kind of oppression of women within the Hollywood milieu, uh, play it as it lays. So that's an interesting book. Um, and then she keeps writing journalism and fiction as well. She has a turn, kind of an international turn in the 80s when she becomes kind of a foreign correspondent and is reporting from uh, El Salvador and other locations. And then she has kind of a political turn later on when she's directly writing about politics from the late 80s into the early 2000s. Uh, and interestingly, the, pol the, the turn in the subject matter also marks a kind of turn in her politics, sort of, though I think this is a little bit overrated. So Joan Didion, when she starts out, I would say her overall temperament politically is a very conservative one. I think I advertised her that way to you last week when we were talking about uh, how all these writers in the postmodern moment we were looking at were participating in these conflicts within the political left around postmodernism. And I said, what does a right winger think? Well, we'll wait to see Joan Didion. And I, so that was maybe a little too simplistic. I don't know if she's a right winger, but I think she has a conservative temperament, which is to say she believes that there are these kinds of definite limits to human beings and that you can't be in any way utopian. That belief that you see in Grace Paley or Ursula Le Guin about the kind of infinite possibilities of human transformation, Didion thinks are really naive and even kind of contemptible and dangerous because you will sort of impose upon the world this utopia that will crush, uh, you know, the individual. And she thinks all that we really have is the individual's perception. If you read a lot of her work, you find this theme recurring again and again. I think it comes up in her novel, Play It As It Lays, that I mentioned, where the narrator says nothing connects to anything else nothing there is no meaning to the world the world she's really almost a kind of nihilist that nothing 
makes any sense. And the only thing you can do is sort of force the world to make sense. But she, and, and if that, that's very postmodern, by the way, isn't it? That's a very postmodern idea. It goes back to, to the existentialist ideas we were talking about, that the world is radically chaotic. I mean, she would agree with Ursula K. Le Guin about that. But where she differs is that if you want to, the way to negotiate that is for the individual perception to sort of negotiate it, for the writer to make sense of it, the individual writer and the individual person. Whereas if you put your faith in collective social transformation, you're just signing up for some utopian totalitarian society, which is a very longstanding conservative idea going back to Edmund Burke, the father of conservatism and his critique of the French Revolution, that in attempting to radically collectively transform society, you create a totalitarian dystopia. So it's interesting because in some ways she's very close to Le Guin and Paley, to these anarchist writers, but where she draws the line is they think that you can build a kind of collective society that will be in this kind of spontaneous harmony without the state that will allow for infinite individual possibilities, that kind of anarcho-communism we were talking about. She's more on the right side of that, that nothing makes any sense, and so the individual is thrown back on the individual's own resources. Um, and maybe tradition could help us out. That's another you know, conservative aspect of her thought is sometimes she'll defend kind of traditions, not because they're true or good or right, but because they've got us this far in this chaos. And so we should stick with them. But otherwise, it, it ends up at a kind of individualism, which I think will signal some of the transformations that conservatism as an ideology was undergoing in this period. We've talked about conflicts but within the left. I think one of the big conflicts in this period within the right that is also deeply shaped by the postmodern moment is that the right politically used before the 60s used to really be all about tradition uh, and kind of the institutions that would marshal traditions such as churches and other kinds of organizations and the right in parallel with the left becomes much more individualist and much more about individual freedom and the freedom of the individual in the 60s. And you see this with the campaign, the failed presidential campaign of Barry Goldwater in 1964, whom Joan Didion voted for and supported. Uh, and he was considered kind of shockingly right wing at the time. Uh, but eventually, when Ronald Reagan is elected in the 80s, he's carrying on Goldwater's legacy, uh, which is a much more individualist brand of conservatism, particularly as applied to economics. Uh, the state is going to retreat from managing the economy, and individuals will have to take care of themselves, maybe with the help of their churches and families and their traditions. And so Didion, I think, reflects this change. And so you see this conservative temperament in her writing, and she says things like, you know, if I thought uh, helping, the, helping some kind of social revolution would make the world a better place, I'd do it, but I don't think that it won't work. Uh, and so she, accordingly, is this iconically individualist writer. I keep using this word iconic for Didion, and it's because she is a kind of celebrity writer. Her image, her kind of branded image, uh, you know, this very cool woman in this long dress, you know, sitting, smoking a cigarette, sitting on this car with her long hair out in California, it becomes this celebrity image in ways that other writers are not, you know, marketed as or, or, or brand themselves as at the time. So she's as much a part of celebrity culture, and it's because of her very visual uh, assertion of self, as well as the assertion of self in her writing. Now, her later political writing in the 80s through the early 2000s is mostly devoted to criticizing the Republican Party, the you know political conservatism, but I think it's not so much a shift in her values as she saw a shift in theirs, that the that they, the, the conservatives became, especially like in the era of George W. Bush wanting to spread democracy through the Middle East, she thought they became almost uh, full of this mania for changing the world, uh, on which she always casts a very cold eye. So 
Sorry, that was a that was a very rambling introduction, and we had many digressions into politics. But that's my introduction to Joan Didion as kind of a a figure, a kind of iconic figure of this moment, and some of the implications of her of her persona as a writer. But what about literarily? Well, literarily, she was known for this style that was very compressed, very cool, very detached, but also through its use of understatement communicated her worldview and often she would portray herself in her essays which you don't get in the excerpt they gave you from the Norton as this kind of um, this very uh, well as she describes so another of her famous books is her 2005 memoir The Year of Magical Thinking which is about the aftermath of her husband's death and her experience of grief and famously the, the early scene in the memoir is where the doctor comes in to tell her that her husband has died and they send in like the grief counselor and the doctor says to the grief counselor uh she seems okay she's a cool customer and that idea that she's a cool customer that she's she's sort of she's 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 nervous she's very highly strung she's very sensitive and she registers every little impression that that sort of comes across the tremulous surface of her prose and yet she is also kind of unflappable she looks at it all with this uh if this isn't a uh, an oxymoron a nervous detachment and i think that nervous detachment in the compressed lines and understated lines of her prose is really what she's known for whether she's writing journalism or memoir or novels so that is my little introduction to Joan Dating. And she's, you know, she's still alive, uh, though I think she stopped writing more or less. Uh, but she's still very admired, uh, also kind of controversial because some of the stances she's taken throughout her life. Um, but also very admired, uh, kind of a model, still a model, I think, to young, uh, young people setting out in journalism. And, uh, you know, there's just a Netflix documentary, I think, last year or the year before about her that, that brought her back into to a lot of public attention. So that's Joan Didion generally. The thing I want to talk about now is the movement she was a part of. So we want to talk about the transformations in journalism, which is arguably a branch of literature, that go along with postmodernism. So Didion is closely associated with this movement called New Journalism. And this was a style of journalism that ar ar arises in the 60s in the work of Didion and the other major famous exponent of it uh, was a writer named Tom Wolfe, also an iconically stylish writer. He wore a white suit everywhere. Uh, so he was this kind of branded image and icon of individualism, also uh, fairly right wing in the new individualist second half of the 20th century mode. So there's a lot he has in common with Didion stylistically, though not in terms of the way they wrote. But the thing they both have in common is they transformed journalism in a way that moved it from the ideal of objectivity. So before the 60s, though this was more short-lived than people realize, it really starts in the late 19th century and goes to the 60s. There's this ideal that if you were a journalist, if you were writing for a broad public for a newspaper or magazine, you should be a kind of scientifically detached person. And your writing should seem neutral. It should seem nonpartisan. It should convey what they used to, the, the phrase they used to use is just the facts. Who, what, where, when. Okay. And that is what journalism should be about. It should be nonpartisan. It should be non um, biased. And this, again, this was not how journalism started when journalism starts out in the in the 18th century or wherever and it's not how journalism was for most of the first 200 years of its existence but by starting in the 1890s and then really in the middle of the 20th century in that mid-century period where the even in poetry the ideal was that you would be impersonal and everybody begin begins to live at mid-century in these impersonal structures remember that square rectilinear concrete architecture we looked at and everybody's living in the big administrative states of whether of the the west or of the eastern bloc that mid-century impersonality is a goal in 
journalism as well, that journalism should just be this neutral scientific thing. Well, just as we have the quarrels within the political right and the left about, you know, getting out from under these big, you know, structures of either the, the political parties and labor unions of the left or the churches and whatever of the right, uh, and just as we have the transformation in literature from an impersonal poetry to a personal confessional poetry that we saw as we moved from Bishop on the one hand to Lowell and Plath on the other. Uh, so in journalism, there comes to be this idea that journalism does not have to be objective anymore, that journalism can be a branch of personal literature, that the journalist can foreground his or her sensibility, his or her subjectivity, uh, his or her literary stylings, uh, because, you know, the old ideal of journalism was that it would be a very transparent mode of writing. Uh, George Orwell said it should be like a window pane. Your prose should be like a window pane. You're just looking out on the world. Well, Tom Wolfe, Joan Didion, and a bunch of other writers come along and they transform journalism into something that's much more personal, that's much more about them, that's much more about their feelings, their sensibilities, their opinions, and their literary style. And that's much more evident in Wolf than it is in Didion, because Wolf, if you just read a page of his journalism from the 60s, it's incredibly almost, uh, to my mind, off-puttingly zany in the way it's written. I mean, he's just using all sorts of experimental literary techniques. A lot of them, I would say, probably derive from beat literature, from people like Ginsburg and Kerouac, this kind of like spontaneous feeling, automatic, jumpy writing. With Didion, in a way, you have the remnant of the old journalistic style in how her prose is so compressed. She writes, she's really a writer of short forms. Even all of her novels are like under 200 pages, basically. Uh, and she doesn't usually write big nonfiction books. Like most of her books are short. And a lot of those short books are composed of or comprised of, never did know that one, uh, shorter pieces, okay? So she, she writes short. And she writes sort of short sentences a lot of the time, and she doesn't use big words. And so there is this sense that the prose is very compressed and very clear, but she arranges the writing in a way that leaves you in no doubt as to what she thinks. And she does it often through the mode of understatement. And then she has other essays, like I said, we're not looking at any of those here, but she has other essays where she does foreground her personality and foregrounds her persona. And that's how she came to be this kind of celebrity writer. And so that's the, sorry, let's get back. Uh, that's the quote I put on the picture. Uh, so the, the, the Norton has the introduction to their creative nonfiction section. And creative nonfiction was a term developed later, I think in the 80s or 90s, to, that sort of followed from new journalism that said, essentially, all nonfiction writing is a branch of literature. You're, not, you're never just reporting the fact. You're never, you can't, because as the postmodernists like Leotard told us, language constructs the world for us. And so if you're writing nonfiction, you're still constructing the world in language. You're not reporting on the world. You're constructing it. You're building a world in language. So in a way, new journalism and creative nonfiction, if you want to put it really strongly, what they really ultimately suggest is there is no such thing as nonfiction, that language is always fictional. Language is always a fictional artifice that makes the world anew, which is what postmodern writers like, you know, from writers as different as Ashbery to, and Le Guin, I think are demonstrating in their work that, you know, representation in things like language and other types of media always uh, kind of replaces reality or is all we ever have access to. We never get to reality. So in their introduction, they note the creative nonfiction is closely allied with what was in the 1970s called the New Journalism. The writer Tom Wolfe published a combined manifesto and anthology with that title in 1973, in which instead of simply reporting on an event, the writer reports on himself or herself within the event, either as a participant or as an observer or both. Okay, so that is let's uh, that is how we can set up Joan Didion's piece, Slouching Towards Bethlehem. So, Slouching Towards Bethlehem is the title of a book she publishes in 1967. 
And the book takes its title from this essay called Slouching Towards Bethlehem that is the the first piece in the book. And it's a long essay that is a series of episodes or vignettes that are fairly short that document Didion's time with the counterculture. Everything from um, hanging out with well, there's different pieces in the book, so I might be running it together. I haven't read the book from cover to cover in a while. But everything from hanging out with people who are members of communist parties to hanging out with uh, some of the famous musicians, pop musicians, rock musicians of the time, like The Doors and Joan Baez, hanging out with people who are maybe members of the Black Panther Party, and or just hanging out in San Francisco with some of the members of the counterculture who are into kind of the the drug uh, the drug underground, the drug subculture, people who are taking hallucinogens uh, and uh, and things like that. So it's a series of kind of short episodes, and she does intersperse her reflections, and her reflections are very disapproving. She's based she basically says something has gone wrong in America. Here I am. And she is, let's see, when was she born? 1934. So she's in her mid-30s as she's writing this. And so she's hanging out with people who are probably younger. People are in their teens and 20s because these countercultural and protest movements were often very much youth movements. So she's writing from the posture of someone slightly older. And she's saying something's gone wrong in America. We've kind of broken the society in such a way that these are the children we've produced who are these kind of lost children of a society that doesn't have any values holding it together. I mean, it's a, despite her, her, you know, cool, iconic status, it's a very classic conservative argument she's making that we've sort of somehow we've, we've knocked out the structures that were holding this society together. And so we've produced this chaos in the streets of San Francisco that I'm watching. And so she has this way of narrating that is a very understated way of showing you the, the things that are going on without directly commenting on them, but in ways that let you know they're they're wrong from her perspective. And so the Norton gives you two, they give you an excerpt that's basically the last two episodes in the in the essay. And like I said, the essay, it's kind of long. It's like a 60 page piece. And she's there's characters, quote unquote, that recur because she's hanging out with people. She's kind of embedded herself as a journalist in this community. And I think somewhere else in the collection, she says writers are always selling someone out. And what she means there is she kind of gained the trust of these people and then sort of reported on them as like these sadly deluded characters on whom we should take a certain uh, <laughs> contemptuous pity because they are the lost children of a broken society. So in that sense, she sold them out. And she's very clear about these things. She's she's not, she never mystifies her own role as a, as a writer. And she has an essay called Why I Write in which she says writing is an aggressive act. Um, Writing is the act of imposing your vision on someone else. It's saying, see things my way, listen to me, and see it the way I see it. And that's very different from, you know, say, James Baldwin, who seemed to see writing in a large, as, in, in a large degree as being about empathy. She has a very uh, kind of just a grimmer view of the world in general, a kind of skeptical, kind of nihilistic view in which all we really have are the structures holding our society together and the kind of uh, the will of the individual to persist in the chaos and the and in her case that manifests itself in her cool persona both in person and in these incised lines of her prose so anyway the norton makes this all a bit easier by giving us two episodes in which i think the the contemporary reader the reader of the last decade is is going to probably agree with her that what she's depicting is wrong. So the first episode is where this series of mime troopers who are these white radicals appear and they appear wearing blackface. So right away, and by the way, that's fully offensive uh, in the 1960s. That's not, uh, it's not like a new thing that that's offensive. That's obviously offensive uh, when that happens and Joan Didion presents it as being offensive. And she, uh, there's a sort of subtle, almost a kind of comedy to the essay because she's always sort of saying things to the people she's with. And they're often too like, um, 
just too much sort of lost to their own sort of drugged out world to understand what she's saying. And so she says early in the essay, she's early in the excerpt, the anthology gives you, she says they're in blackface. Like she's alarmed because she knows this is offensive and this is going to cause a problem. Uh, and the other people she's there, she's with are sort of not uh, seeing the issue. And so then she depicts this really disturbing scene where these white radicals who are wearing blackface accost a black man and they're trying to sort of provoke him as if he should be on their side politically and they say to him who stole Chuck Berry's music and the reference there is Chuck Berry was a uh, pioneering African-American rock musician and by the late 60s rock had gone from being a type of music that had in the 50s been primarily associated with African-American culture to being primarily associated with white culture with the Beatles and then you know everything that follows from them and so they try to talk to this black man on the grounds that he'll agree with them if they say that uh, the that the white man stole black music and he disagrees he says you know Chuck Berry's music belongs to everybody and this kind of conversation about cultural appropriation is one on which there is always a lot of disagreement and so it's a conversation that always needs to be had and i think that reasonable people can disagree he takes the position that it's not that it's not that that the universalization of his music was was uh, was was fine but the the point the point really isn't the conversation they're having because reasonable people could differ on this matter the point is the way in which the white radicals are being so presumptuous first of all to wear blackface which is an intensification of something we saw in the beats which was this presumptuous identification of the white radical uh who has had this kind of middle class aesthetic descent against their society with people who were oppressed on the grounds of race so the first didion is observing that uh, and I think, you know, probably we agree that she's right to, to, to sort of point out in her understated portrayal of this that these people are behaving uh, unethically and stupidly. And they get more aggressive. They say, uh, he says, Chuck Berry's music belongs to everybody. Yeah, girl in blackface says, everybody who? Why, he says, confused, everybody in America. In America, the blackface girl shrieks, listen to him talk about America. What did America ever do for you? So it it's now not a thing where they're trying to be in coalition, in solidarity with, with African Americans who have a legitimate uh, critique of the way they've been treated in the United States. They're now, so we have these white radicals wearing blackface lecturing this guy about how he should think about this. And again, it's a it's a little parable of how Didion thinks radicalism works, that it destroys individualism, it dest it oppresses the individual. So you have this poor man who's being beleaguered by these people who have accosted him, and he gives his view, which is uh, anyone you know one could differ with his view, but it's surely within the realm of reason for him to think this, and they're lecturing him and accosting him and. Uh, and then by the end of the passage, she addresses him as boy, which is the classic racist trope, particularly in the South, that the, the white racist would address adult black people as boy or gal to diminish them. And so whatever they were trying to do initially as this kind of anti-racist protest, whatever they were trying to do, ends up just being the old racism. They, they don't escape it at all. They fall right back into it. And so Didion is pointing out these ironies of radicalism, that it's ineffectual, that it, it, it it's oppressive in itself. So, uh, and again, though, note, this is one scene. She could have written about, you know, any other scene. Uh, so she chooses and she has a very good eye. She chooses this moment. And I, I don't doubt she saw this and that things like this happen. But she chooses this as this kind of uh, gem-like parable of what, of what radicalism does. And then the famous ending of the essay, the thing it all builds up toward, is her dystopian portrait of when she returns to this place she'd been living with these 
hippies who are the they the hippies are like the further development of the beats these kind of uh countercultural people who want to drop out of society take drugs have visionary experiences it's kind of what comes out of the the beat worldview and so the climax the end of the essay is she comes back to these people and she sees this little girl who's five years old and she has either taken or they've her parents or her caretakers have given her acid hallucinogens lsd and so that's the thing the essay is building up to is this final vision of the corruption of innocence when i finally find otto he says i got something at my place that'll blow your mind and when we get there i see a child on the living room floor wearing a reefer coat reading a comic book she keeps licking her lips in concentration and the only off thing about her is that she's wearing white lipstick five years old otto said on acid so that little understated line of dialogue and notice he's not saying he doesn't say to her you know the the uh, uh, the child is on serious hallucinogens we've got to do something he says yeah this is cool this will blow your mind five years old on acid and he thinks this this is cool uh you know he thinks this is great he thinks this is a fun thing to show her and what does she think let's read The five-year-old's name is Susan, and she tells me she is in high kindergarten. She lives with her mother and some other people, just got over the measles, wants a bicycle for Christmas, and particularly likes Coca-Cola, ice cream, Marty and the Jefferson Airplane, Bob and the Grateful Dead, and the beach. She remembers going to the beach once, a long time ago, and wishes she had taken a bucket. For a year now, her mother has given her both acid and peyote. Susan describes it as getting stoned. I start to ask if any of the other children in high kindergarten get stoned, but I falter at the key words. So, the high literary artistry here, this is very good. So, note she gives you these mundane details of an ordinary childhood. She wants a bicycle for Christmas, she likes Coca-Cola, but then these discordant details. She likes these, you know, members of adult bands who are all, you know, countercultural bands. And she she remembers going to the beach once a long time ago. So this innocence is lost. This innocence that she had. She's only five years old, but the, you know it was a long time ago and she was innocent. For, for a year now, her mother has given her both acid and peyote. And, and then Joan Didion's subjectivity comes out. I start to ask her if any of the other children in high kindergarten get stoned but I falter at the key words. So this consummate writer is at a loss for words. And why? Because obviously she's choking up. She's going to start crying at this terrible spectacle. But that emotion is sort of present just in this understated way. She just tells you, I falter, but you know that she's there and what she's thinking and the persona of the writer is there. And this is what the counterculture leads to, the destruction, the corruption of innocence. And that's what happens when you sort of knock out the stabilizing structures of a society. So that, <laughs> that, as I promised, is what a right winger thinks of all this. So that, but note again, I want to emphasize again, Joan Didion starts in the same place Grace Paley and Ursula K. Le Guin and some of these other writers start. Joan Didion is a postmodern writer. She begins with skepticism that we can make sense of the world, that the world is anything other than radically uncertain. Where her conservatism kicks in as against their radicalism is she thinks that doesn't mean the world is an open, uh, open-ended open place of possibility and we should all try to change everything all the time, which is their utopian view. She thinks, no, that it's actually terrifying that the world is so chaotic. And so we need stable structures and strong individual self-reliance and then stable communities for the individual to fall back on. And so in that way, it's a kind of postmodern conservatism as opposed to the postmodern radicalism we've been seeing in other writers. So that is Joan Didion, um, and that is the end of this lecture. Thanks very much, and have a great day.